came in who'd just been saved in the last year. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> and uh, he, he was under a strong anointing in the meeting. You could pick it out. No church background, no religious upbringing per se. Young man in trouble, 18-year-old, out in the world doing what the world tends to do and had a massive encounter with God to the degree that he actually had a, a burning bush experience. And uh, he walked into the fire of the living God, burst out into tongues, fell on the floor and was radically saved. So he brought that kind of anointing in on him. No nine years of theological training, no 45 years in church. Hallelujah, praise God. But he just came in with the freshness of the Spirit, burst into the Spirit and began to pray for the church. And normally he'd say, excuse me, out of order, wrong etiquette, sit down, we don't know you. The anointing was all over him. But in that experience, the Lord said to me, this year, those who've never encountered God have to encounter God. Because the pressures will be so great that religious tradition, good intentions won't be enough for us to go from victory to victory, strength to strength, glory to glory. You have to meet him in all of his glory and all of his power. I was thinking about the burning bush experience, how Moses, who was a shepherd, had that awesome experience of the burning bush and became a mighty deliverer of Israel. If ever Australia needed mighty deliverers, this is the hour. If ever the city of Perth needed deliverers, this is the hour. If ever the young people of Northbridge need deliverers, this is the hour. So it's not a season for us to just say, oh, let's just do church and play church and pretend. Let's open our hearts to God and say, God, finish the work in me. And the message that I feel to share this morning is on preparing for the glory. It's an ongoing message. We're always preparing in one sense. But there's a levels of glory already starting to fall and the church needs to be ready for it. And Lynn, I think you had that, uh, there was an open vision at the meeting last time. Do you want to just share that? Oh, if you don't mind about the Lord and breathing, about the church unable to receive everything. Please. Yep. I'm just going from memory when we were in worship a couple of Sundays ago. Um, I had an open vision of the Spirit of God breathing and it was like um, it was like a puff of steam coming out of his mouth and and I, everything in my spirit was was anticipating because it was creative breath that it would it would build but what i what I saw was that it was it was as soon as it was coming out of his mouth it was dissipating and it was like as if the sense was it was there was so much needed to spread over the entire body, but it wasn't God who was limited, it was the body who was limiting God. And that the limitation that, that I sensed as I was seeing the vision was that the Lord was saying, I have so much more that I want to breathe out, so much more I want to build up. But he was saying that the, the attitude of my people in their everyday life is not an attitude of praise and thanksgiving. And he was really talking about everyday life and he said, as my people choose to praise and thank me in and through all circumstances in everyday life, in the heart, it was a hard attitude. It's not going aside and having a special praise time with the Lord. It was a hard attitude. And it was like God was saying, that will release me for this wind and this, this breath that's coming out of my, my, my mouth to, to absolutely build and build. And then I also saw it come back to the Lord and I saw the Lord as the Ancient of Days, uh, the Father, it was actually the Father as the Ancient of Days and he was saying, do not go into the new and drop everything of the old that is of me. He said to the people, don't be seeking and searching for something different because there's nothing different that is totally of God. That which is, was of God a thousand years ago is exactly what is, which is of God yeah, now. Right. There's nothing different mm. that that which is of the old that belongs with the new. That's so right. be careful what we cast aside and what we pick that's up. Right, exactly right. 
I also saw fire and I sense, and really I feel that Phil actually did that this morning, but I, I sensed in the fire, I, I was seeing, I looked up the scriptures because it was smoke, what, what I kept getting with the word smoke, and as I looked up the scriptures, um, two scriptures particularly struck out to me and they were two scriptures that had the word smoke and fire in them and one of them and it was really a warning from the Lord so you need to take this the right way and it was in Ezekiel but it said do not try to see me if you haven't consecrated yourself so I guess part of the message for the glory is to enter into his glory is not a familiar thing. It is wonderful to confidently go into the throne room because of his grace and mercy, but, but not to be so familiar that we, are, we do not consecrate ourselves and prepare our hearts so that God and the fire of God can work with us so that we walk a, a, a level of depth in God and not a superficial Christianity. And the other one that had smoke and fire in it was the Isaiah 6 one when Isaiah said, Whoa, I'm a man of unclean lips, but I dwell amidst a people of unclean lips. But how glorious that the fire of God, which I saw this morning in that blanket, I saw coals of fire, that the angels were able to touch supernaturally and cleanse. But... This, the thing that the Lord was highlighting with that smoke and fire was that that cleansing was a part of the consecration because immediately after that, Isaiah was able to surrender and go, here I am, send me, and God commissioned. And I just felt that at the beginning of this year that God is actually wanting to release new commissions to many people, but the, the consecration is what is necessary before the commissioning can occur. So it's like he's saying, don't bite at the bit. Don't try to see me, because I warn you, if you try to see me without the consecration, I will break out upon you. And so sometimes, that's really heavy, isn't it? We've got to interpret that correctly, because he loves us. He loves us so much that if we don't get it, and we don't get it, and we don't get it, like a father of love, he sort of has to go smack, 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 because I love you. You know, and sometimes we don't do what we're meant to do unless we feel a little smack. Is that right? Okay, so he wants us to read that that way. He will break out upon us. In other words, I'll have to discipline you and chastise you a bit more strongly because if you don't judge yourself, I'll have to sort of judge you a little bit. Okay? Amen. Amen. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Brave girl. That's good. That's wonderful. Hallelujah. Going to do what I saw in the spirit round about here, like a circle of there's a whirlwind happening. There's a whirlwind of the spirit coming down on the meeting. So, if anyone in this group say, Yep, that's me, just stand. Not the whole church, just starting where the breakthrough point is round about here. Three or four come, a couple of rows, just like a circle. That's what I'm saying. You want to receive it? You don't have to stand, but that's just a <laughs> sign. Father, if that be true, Father God, and church, just reach your hands out towards these. We say, Lord, let that fire fall, Lord God. Let that anointing come, Lord God. Let that blessing move, Lord. You are a God of breakthrough. Breakthrough, 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 Lord God. Breakthrough, Lord, right through. Oh, let it come, 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 let it come. Lord, ever increasing circles around the room, Lord. The glory of the Lord, the glory of the Lord. Lord, you always have breakthrough points, entrance points in the spirit. Let this be one, an open portal. In Jesus' mighty name, open portal. Receive it. Thank him for the healing, for the deliverance, for the restoration, whatever you need for revival. Revival, revival. To receive it, receive it, receive it, receive it, receive it. Oh, let it splash on others who are around. Don't be offended by this. Just receive it. God often comes through breakthrough places in the spirit. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. And for this family, I feel the Lord saying that uh, his hand has been firmly upon you and upon, obviously upon uh, Wolfgang and the Lord's favour is upon you all. And the in, or, original prophecy from Germany that you would come and you would serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord says the years ahead are full of gladness. Full of gladness, full of gladness. Just fo- focus on Jesus, trust him, rely upon him. Even if the enemy tries to come in, the Lord said, like a flood, the Holy Spirit will come and raise up a standard. Let's reach out to this family. Father, I thank you that many years ago, Lord, right across the, 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 
the other side of the world, you said they would come to Australia and they would serve you. Let this be the hour, let this be the day, Father, we pray. Let this be the hour, let this be the day. Let this be the hour, let this be the day. Oh, Sabine, the new release comes upon you in worship. The Lord says that the heart of worship is going to break forth, break forth, break forth. There'll be a spate of healing and deliverance as a result of the uh, anointing upon you. The Lord says, don't be timid, don't be shy. Go in Jesus' name. Just uh, for, for Helga, stretch out to Helga. Healing, healing, healing in the name of Jesus. Oh my gosh, we're all getting it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And uh, Umki, it's obvious, evangelism, 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 evangelism for you and Andreas, evangelism, financial breakthrough, evangelism, financial breakthrough, financial breakthrough. And don't forget the Lord says you and your household, don't worry about the children, the Lord's got them all. Thank you, Father God. And for you, God, thank you, Father, for you, Lord God. Big muscly you, we reach out to him today, Father. Father, we declare, Lord, that the heart, Lord God, would be strangely warmed, Father God, and he would enjoy his God, remove the hurts of the past and say, Lord, this man, raise him up as a standard, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Glory. Let God be God. Let God be God. Say it with me. Let God be God. Uh, You know what the other part says, don't you? Let every man be a liar. But let God be God. Isaiah 40 this morning. Isaiah 40. Hallelujah. wonderful chapter even as all of the scriptures are wonderful chapters sometimes there are certain things that God speaks if my voice goes down and the echo stops I'll be very happy boys hallelujah thank you Jesus verse 3 of uh, Isaiah chapter 40 and just going down to start with verse 5 the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord make straight in the desert a highway for God Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. I'm sure we've heard that many, many times, that wonderful prophecy of Isaiah that's been fulfilled, of course, in the ministry of John the Baptist, the ministry of Jesus who's come, Saviour, Healer, Deliverer. But I felt there's principles here that are important for us because you and I are still preparing for the fulfilment of the call upon our lives. In some measure we may be doing it, but there are greater levels of service to be uh, drawn from us in the years that lie ahead. Your best days are ahead. Hallelujah. My best days are ahead. When, try not to count the number of the years, but we're just saying our best days are ahead. Hallelujah. That can go down. My voice can go up. Hallelujah. And if we have that kind of attitude rather than, oh, well, you know, my best days are behind me, then something within us begins to uh, die. But if we say, you know, there's good things and bad things behind me, but the door's closed, finished. And let me say this, regret is the most useless emotion you can have. Regret is a useless emotion. It's finished, door's closed, and we're moving ahead in God. And if there be perchance unresolved issues, the Holy Spirit himself will take charge to sort that out. We should not be looking back. We should not be looking to the left or right because you do go into the direction that you're looking. And so we want to move ahead through an open door. Scriptures say the doors of utterance, the doors of opportunity. Paul says, I'm praying that doors of ministry be open. He says, I'm praying that effectual doors for my communication will be open. He's declaring that, God, you make a way, that there are some doors, Revelation says, that God will shut that no man can ever open and again. Hallelujah for that one. And the Lord says, the doors that I can open that no other man can open because I surround you with favour like a shield. Now, if you don't believe that, you say, well, 2014 will be the same as all the other years I've had. Well, God bless you, we love you, and that's exactly how it will be for you. If, however, we say, this is going to be a great year because I'm serving a great God, I've learned a whole lot of things over the years and I'm going for it. Then you'll have a wonderful year, a fruitful year, a blessed year. Choice is ours. Choose you this day. So I felt in my spirit the Lord brought me back to Isaiah where there's some principles that would really, I think, be helpful to us. Whoa, thank you, Lord. God prepares people for glory. Even though glory is glory's coming in a great measure and there are many having the, what I call just the outward touch of the glory. 
fantastic. I love the outward touch. I love the glory that pours down. But there's something even perhaps more significant happening and that's the rising of the glory from within. That's Christ in us, the hope of glory. That's that inner strength of the Christ life that's rising up and filling the church. Yes, let the glory come. Whenever God moves, there's an opening of the heavens and an outpouring of the Spirit. But there's also a stirring of the deep. Even in the book of Genesis, when the floods came, it says that both the rain came, continuously pouring down, but there's a release from the depths. That which was from the earth and under the earth was rising up at the same time. And so it is with glory. The glory comes. You sense the glory. You feel the glory. You see the glory. You have the gold dust as the evidence and now people are moving into all sorts of other manifestations. Evidence of the glory. But I want to tell you, Christ in us, the hope of glory. The life of Christ rising up is the glory of God. And, and it's, it's keeping the glory, it's walking in the glory, it's living in the glory, it's staying in the glory that's required. God is not giving hours of visitation, he's giving now a time of habitation. It's not a time for God to visit us, it's a time for God to make his home truly in us in such a measure that the world will turn and see the rising of that glory in the church. And so the preparation is, according to the scripture, verse 3, Isaiah 40, the voice of one crying in the wilderness... Now the wilderness is the experience where you and I have to find God for ourselves and have to encounter God for ourselves. No one particularly likes the wilderness experience but wilderness is part of the journey and wilderness is not barrenness. Wilderness is a place of isolation, maybe aloneness, might seem like unfriendly surroundings, a bit of personal discomfort, there might be some sense of confinement and you're alone with God. You may be busy, there may be people, but you in your heart are alone with God. No one understands, no one hears, no one knows my divine dissatisfaction, no one knows my cry. You know why? No one else needs to know, but God needs to know. God needs to hear the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. And uh, there's not many people who will allow themselves to cry to God in the wilderness. They just can't get can't wait to get out and get into the, to the joyous place. But there is joy in the wilderness as well. And without that, your voice is not formed. Your cry is not formed. Your call is not formed. And what tends to happen in religion is that we have a faint echo of someone else's call. We've listened to so many tapes by the same speaker that now we're cloning ourselves with that kind of spirit. And there's echoes all over the body of Christ. God is not listening for echoes. He wants your voice. He wants the voice that's been formed under the pressure, under the difficulties, under the confinement, where you alone know that only God can help you. That's part of everyone's Christian experience. And for some it seems to be a lifetime Christian experience. You know the developing of a leader is far greater than just as it were the average in terms of the average Christian. All love the same, but the one who says, God, I really want to fulfil my call. The training is different. The processes are different. The place where you get the vision to the place you get the provision is different. The length may be different. So you can't copy. You can't say, I'll do it like that. Just as we as a fellowship can't say, well, I want to be like that fellowship down the road. Now, in the measure of Christ's likeness, yes, we do. But in all that's particular to us, no, we don't. You deal with us, Lord God. You show us, Lord God. Let our voice, corporate individual, be formed. And God is listening for my voice. He's listening for your voice. In worship this morning, he wanted to hear your voice. He wanted to hear your cry. He wanted to know what really is happening in the depths of your heart this morning. Not just getting caught up in something. You can have charismatic religion. You can have Pentecostal religion. You can have, inverted commas, glory religion. There's certain things that we do that repeat and we just now have another format and we just keep doing the same thing. It's religion. That's why I like spontaneity. It annoys some people, but I can't help it. Every now and again something breaks out and I thought, I'm going with it. And by the fruit you know. If it means nothing and does nothing, then you pull back and say, okay, I think I missed that. But I saw an open portal coming down here. I saw an open portal coming down. It's no use me saying, let's ignore it, pretend it's not happening. If it's happening, it's happening. And if God requires faith to draw from it, we draw from it. And something happens, there'll be something happening in all of our hearts. May not understand it fully because God's a God of mystery as well as revelation. You don't have to know it all, you have to trust him in it. 
I've got to trust him in things. There are a whole lot of things. I've had, true confession time. I haven't a clue what to do. There are times that my God, I have no idea. Turn around three times and sit down again. I don't know what to do. And the Lord goes, that's good son. There's mystery involved in this faith decision. Hear my voice, do what I say and you just may understand further down the track. Revelation comes. God gives revelation when you need it. And he says the things that are revealed belong to you. But the mystery is in the hands of God and God is in charge of mystery. I like mystery. But I don't want the whole thing to be a mystery. I mean, that's bordering on the ridiculous. I, I know nothing. Well, excuse me, time you learn and got the knowledge of God. But there are some things I don't understand. I don't understand why someone gets the miracle and someone has the process of healing. But why do I have to understand it? I don't understand why some people never get healed and yet seemingly are doing that which is appropriate and right. I don't understand it. Maybe I don't have to understand it. Maybe we just say, Lord, things I don't understand belong to you and I trust you, but the things that I do understand belong to me and I'm responsible to do what I know to do. And it says it belongs to your children as well. As uh, uh, you said about replicate, that we are to give, we are to... A disciple makes disciples. Paul said to someone... Timothy, <laughs> the faithful things give to faithful things and find other faithful men to give it to more faithful men. Replicate. Let it multiply. Hallelujah. God is good. Crying in the wilderness is a good thing. Staying in the wilderness forever is not such a happy thing. But understand God will require those times where it's just you and him. Your voice, your message has been developed and the God is giving you a message not from a library, giving you a message not from a set of uh, tapes, but he's giving you a message from your experience. It's very, very powerful when you've got your own voice. So in, in the preparing of the cry, verse 3, the cry then begins to prepare the way of the Lord. Your own experience, your own circumstances begin to make a way for God to move. First your cry before God will move. You draw near, I'll draw near. You cry, I'll answer and show you things you don't know. So the cry is important. Let it out. Let it rip. Have your time with God every day. Speak to him. Let him know what's happening, what you're feeling, what you're sensing. Because then that makes way for the Lord to move. He deals with us individually. Praise God that he does that. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. So we need our voice and then God begins to move on our behalf. And it says in verse uh, 3, the voice of the one crying prepares the way of the Lord. I was thinking of the great men and women who have had the call of God and we are allowed to search scriptures to find examples of those who have been called and what happened in the processes of their call and you know, some of the heroes and heroines of faith. Sometimes it's good to reflect on them. I was thinking particularly of David and how all of, the David, all of the people praised him and he was sort of lifted up and exalted in that place. And then circumstances began to change. He fled into the wilderness, hid in the cave, at Dullam's cave, like a criminal, with the others who were in defeat and discouraged and discontent. And uh, God heard his voice in the midst of those circumstances. You know, sometimes the call comes with great pomp and ceremony, great excitement, wonderful prophetic words laid on a hand, slain in the spirit. All sorts of wonderful experiences start happening. And then as you begin to be trained to move into the fullness of what that means, sometimes it gets a little bit harder. It's like the party's not quite over, but it's not the same intensity as it was. Now I'm finding things are against me and there's some things I've got to work through and there's hidden things coming forth and I get a bit of persecution, I've got a lot of un misunderstanding, family doesn't understand what I'm doing, preparing for ministry, etc. All this stuff starts happening. David's response was he ran, he hid, he's in the cave. But the cry came forth and God began again to prepare the way. And you know the end result of the mighty men that rose up. Mighty men, David and his mighty men. That always thrills me. We think of Elijah. Elijah was made a great hero, a king, had great victory over the prophets of Baal. I love reading that account in Kings and Chronicles. I love getting the, oh, the bloodshed and guts. I love that bit about, you know, devil, your day has already come at the cross. It came. 
The full judgment hasn't been seen yet but I'll tell you it's done in the spirit and that day will happen for the wicked. And yet we see Elijah with one threat from Jezebel. It shows you the power of the Jezebelic anointing. One word from Jezebel and he ran and he hid and he curled up and he covered over and he was petrified and he wanted to die. He'd been a great hero. He'd tasted great victory. He had success. He had fame as it were. And yet in part of the preparation for his own voice to be heard, for his cry to be formed, he went through some pretty heavy stuff. But as his voice was formed, the way of the Lord was made. And the Lord came, Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah, you know, came forth out of the darkness of the cave and he stood and God began to make a way. You know, the story of the wind and the earthquake and the fire and then that beautiful, still, small voice of God. God still moves primarily in his dealing with you and me through the still, small voice. I love fire. I love action. I love open portals of glory. I love all these things that happen and there's going to be more and more operations of the Holy Spirit according to 1 Corinthians 12 that we haven't seen in our generation. But at the same time, to sit with God and to know that the Christ within is talking, that Christ within, a still small voice is bubbling up. When it talks about the still small voice, it's talking about the thoughts that bubble up and they intersect with the natural thinking and the natural circumstances, the voice comes forward. The word of the Lord bubbles up. It's not necessarily the loud word. It's not necessarily written on the wall with the finger of God. It's just a still small voice. That's why it's ignored by so many people. Just those quiet thoughts rising up in the spirit. But Elijah, he had the voice of God. He heard the voice of God. He responded and a new mandate, new anointing and off he went. I think of Moses, once a prince of Egypt. And yet we know the story of Moses, how... He ended up being, as it were, on the backside of the desert, stripped of his home, stripped of his privileges, his wealth, his power, as a prince brought up by the, the, the daughter's king of the king's daughter. And yet here he was, the backside of the desert, 40 years as a shepherd. What a time of preparation. How many of us think, you know, I've been about 40 years and I'm still being prepared. But Israel's mighty deliverer stepped down. The right time, the right place, a season such as this, a brother had a word this morning. Lots of brothers here. I'll pick the best looking one over there. Just say it, what you saw in the worship, please. Just have a drink. You think it's water, but it's not. Oh, Spirit, of God. Spirit of God's coming on me. So we find that from the moment that the call comes, God requires to hear your voice. What's your response? What's really happening? Where are you really at? He he must hear it. You can't just say, well, I'm just going to sort of do this thing called Christian ministry, Christian service. There's no such a thing. It's your response to God. Your voice prepares the way for you. We see it through these great men and women that God has used in the past. And here we have, as it were, like a blueprint Make straight in the desert. And if ever there was a time and a season for, the, for us and the body of Christ to make it straight, this is the season. To make straight means to get it right, to stand uprightly. We are the righteous. The righteous need to live righteously. To be pleasing, to be good. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 talks about, what does it talk about? In all your ways... Tell the person next to you what you think it says. In all your ways. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your own understanding. So you all got it wrong. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall. Now the word direct is the same word used in Isaiah 40 for make straight. The word direct, he will direct, he will make straight the path. If you will acknowledge the Lord, if you will trust the Lord, if you don't lean on what you think, he will make straight. He will direct. And, and it's the word of the Lord that is straight. The word of the Lord is the truth. God speaks the truth. So he will make straight your path. That means that the crooked ways, any perverted ways, any twisted ways, 
the work of Satan's lies and deception, half-truths, compromise, all these things that can enter the human soul because of our brokenness, where we misrepresent the truth or we have a half a truth, we have a wrong emphasis, all these things we are prone to because we are people who are maturing into Christ's likeness. But if we don't acknowledge it, then we'll keep doing that which is not straight. It's not getting us directly in the way that God has chosen for us. That's why it took so long for Israel to get out of the wilderness, whereas in fact the promised land was only just a short journey away. But the whole 40-year experience took that long because that's how long it was taking them to get it straight and to get it right. So if we will say, Lord, by your spirit, by the truth of your word, I want to make it straight and get it right quickly. Someone said to me the other day, experience has been my best teacher. I said, it's been one of my worst teachers. My best teacher is the word of God and if I listen to the word of God and get it right quickly, that's the best way to learn. My experience has been a pain in many, many ways. There have been joyous times as well. But it's taken an awful long time to learn what the word has declared right from the beginning. So when we come to the word and say, Lord, make straight my path. Hey, darling, you having church? That's all right, you're allowed to. Freedom, freedom. So making it straight is important. In Acts chapter 13, verse 6 to 10. I'll just try and quickly go through this because it's warm in here. Acts chapter 13 talks about Paul talking to (laughs) Elimus. Come out in Jesus' name. Well, it could have either been the dog or Mary. I just wasn't sure. I looked over. <laughs> They've both got hairy legs. No, 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 no. Whoa, it's it up. Stop. X13. Acts chapter 13, verse 6. Acts 13, verse 6. Now, where, when they'd gone through the island to, to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of the Lord. But Elimus the sorcerer, for so his name sounds, is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Now, this is active in today's occult realm. Uh, infiltrating churches, you've got, um, you've, you've got saints and sor- sorcerers that go to church. But when the anointing reaches a certain level, the sorcerer either gets saved or heads off. So we don't, don't have to even worry about it. You've got, you've got weeds and you've got plants and they grow together. But the Lord's judgment falls. You, you don't, it's not flesh and blood arguments or fights. It's just levels of anointing that you and I need to get to. Amen. So Saul, who was also poor, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked and said, you are full of deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? See, we have not only an occult practitioner, but you have those who are dabbling in witchcraft who will pervert the ways of the Lord. Remember, charismatic witchcraft has infiltrated the body of Christ. That's where it's like a form of humanism. I think I want, I desire, I will get what I want in my church. That is witchcraft. Witchcraft is not just demonic, it's a work of the flesh. Galatians 5 says, it's when you desire with your flesh to get what you want outside of the will of God, the enemy then will come and empower it. It becomes a powerful force. But when men and women say, you know what, I'm going to make it straight, I'm going to get it right, Lord, what are you saying? That's what I'm going to do. Then the whole body of Christ goes forth in glory to glory. Hallelujah. So here it says, you're full of deceit, you're full of witchcraft, you're full of all these spirits that are not of God. You're perverting the straight way. So this is a principle of scripture we need to understand. We need truthful, accurate, uh, honest representation of truth, the word, knowing who God is through Christ. And we need the Lord to straighten out wrong thinking, religious thinking, denominational bias and get it out of our spirit forever. So we have the first principle, make straight the way of the Lord. But secondly, it goes on from there, Every valley shall be exalted. Isaiah, again, Isaiah 40 verse 4. Every valley shall be exalted. What are we talking about with the exalting of valleys? Every valley, Isaiah 40. 
Every valley will be exalted and every mountain will be brought low. So the valleys that need to be exalted, I I understand has been the low places in our lives, the deficits, the defeats, the weaknesses, that which is not part of our experience, that which we lack. These are the low places. Every human being has low places. We've all got strengths but we've got weaknesses. But to acknowledge weaknesses, it takes a, a, a humble person. Lord, I have a problem in this area. I've got a love debt. Most human beings have love deficits because no one's been loved perfectly, of course, outside of Christ. And so we come to our human experience with a love deficit. I'm not blaming parents, but I'm understanding that no perfect love is given except in God. So every human being has a craving for love and we have a love deficit. The Word of God says that that valley needs to be exalted. Be filled with the love of God, shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. There are times when you and I just need to absolutely indulge ourselves in the knowledge that he loves me and to sit and just absolutely thrive on the fact that he's the lover of my soul and allow that intimacy of truth to become the experience. Feel love, know that you're loved, know that there's arms, everlasting arms are wrapped around you. When sometimes I look up and, and see an open heaven, I understand the Lord's lifting me up, he's underneath me. I know he's a rear guard because there's a lot of mopping up to do in my life. And so the Lord himself all around me, as the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people. I know that sometimes from a male viewpoint, they go, oh, we're getting a bit soppy, isn't it? But see, this is the language of God. God is a love God. The new creature is a love creature. You are conceived by the Holy Spirit loving your dead human spirit to life. and A new creature was formed. Any Christian that doesn't operate out of love is not operating out of the life of Christ. And so we need to fill up the valleys, fill up the valleys, the insecurities, the weaknesses, the poor self-esteem, the unbelief, shame, guilt, valleys of defeat, discouragement, disappointment. I mean, you could name so many names that have caused valleys in our experiences. I'm not talking about the reborn human spirit, I'm talking about the soul that still carries the memory of things of the past. We need to believe that the spirit is what is connected to God and is true but nevertheless the soul needs to be restored by the word of God Hallelujah, thank you Jesus fill up the valleys, let the Holy Spirit do it a love deficit faith deficit, some people who are Christians have faith deficits, they don't have enough word in them and so their experience is based on what they think and what they feel and how they interpret rather than what the word says you can't walk in faith without the word faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word this is our daily diet And if you find your spirit has a diet of a couple of snacks on a Sunday twice a month and yet you have unbelief, three three hot meals a day, have a guess which one's going to be stronger. The unbelief will be far stronger than the faith. But if my daily diet, this is my food, I eat this Lord God, I'm receiving this today. You don't worship the Bible but you want the truth to be filling your heart and mind 24-7. Think on these things, meditate on these things day and night. And uh, that, that is what causes the deficit to be filled. Every valley shall be exalted. Say it with me, every valley, every valley shall be exalted. Say it to someone else, every valley shall be exalted. Hallelujah. And I find that when I get to the bottom of the valley, all I have to do is to pull out the seed of lies and deception and plant the seed of the word of God and the whole thing starts to fill up with truth. You'll find at the bottom of every valley there'll be seeds that have been planted. And every seed produces after its own kind. You've just got to pull them out, rip it out, put the truth in. Thank you, Jesus. Let that grow. And you'll find before long the problem's disappearing, lessening, the pressure of it's going and that deficit's being filled up. And uh, verse, second part of that same verse, every valley will be exalted, every mountain and hill be brought low. Well, then what are the mountains in our lives? The mountains of whatever exalts itself against the knowledge of God. 2 Corinthians talks about cast down the imaginings, the arguments, the reasoning. I don't know how your head functions. I, sometimes I reason things out. It's ridiculous. I know that God's going to win it, but I still want to reason it. Because he says, come and reason. But he says, come and reason, knowing that he's going to win it anyway. Because truth always wins over lies. And some of our reasonings are pretty pathetic. Some of our conclusions we think are logical. They're not logical, they're ridiculous. God's ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. This is the whole thing of trusting God. I don't understand it, Lord, but when I don't understand it, I trust you anyway, Lord. That's what faith is all about. As long as you have the word of God on the matter, you can trust God on it. It's not everyone's opinion. It's not even the majority. The majority are not necessarily right. 
It's Lord, what are you saying? And when you've got that deep in your spirit, then you can move with that. Every mountain, all the arguments, all the reasonings, all the things that exalt themselves, personal agendas, selfish ambitions, self-reliance, rebellion, competitive attitudes, these are the things that rise up and sort of promote us and oh, I'm bigger in my eyes than I really am, but boy, I'm enjoying this experience, you know. Do you know that the wolfish characteristics that come into the body of Christ, there are wolves, but there are sheep with wolfish characteristics. Because the wolf, thought about this, it's very sad, I met a pastor, his name is Pastor Wolf, and I thought, oh, you poor man, you, you were off on the wrong start from the beginning. But anyway, I did my best to trust him. <laughs> pastor Wolf, oh, Jesus, help me. And um, I, I did a study on it, what, what's the difference between the sheep and the wolf? And I realised the number... <laughs> Oh dear, um, wait a minute, where were we? <laughs> How the wolf, the wolf hangs around sheep. He hangs around sheep. So he's attracted to where sheep go. Have you guess where sheep go? They, they find shepherds. And shepherds are pastors. They don't have to be appointed pastors. They're men and women who carry pastoral anointings. You've always got people around you. It's, it's not right or wrong to have people around you. If you're strongly prophetic or strongly a teacher anointing, people don't tend to gravitate around and cuddle into you because you've got a different kind of spirit that speaks truth in a different way. So it's not right or wrong. But you find if people are all over you and around you and behind you, you're probably a shepherd. They're probably picking up something in your spirit that likes the sheep. Not everyone likes sheep. Some people say, I love Jesus, I just can't handle his family. But others go, I love the sheep. I love the sheep. But the wolf says, I love the sheep too. <laughs> because the first thing the wolf does, he mixes with the sheep and brings discontent. He actually begins to stir them. Next thing they're on guard, they're fearful, they're anxious, they're not settled, they're not resting. You find so many people are restless in churches and I keep thinking, it's easier to say it's the church's fault. In some cases maybe it is, but in other cases... What spirit is agitating the sheep? What is infiltrated that is robbing us of our peaceful, restful place in the spirit? Because that's what the shepherd does. The shepherd does, I'm going to have you in a safe place and you're going to be content, you're going to be fed, and you're going to be looked after and you're going to be loved. The next thing you want to do, you want to lie down and rest in that quiet place. The human spirit needs to find the place of rest. And the place of rest is not inactivity, it's the place of fully trusting in God. It's the place of faith. But so much agitation in the body of Christ. People say, oh, it's because of the state of the church. And I say, well, it's more than that. There's something in our spirit that's being stirred up by demon powers that are masquerading as, I think they're religious demons probably. So I thought about this and I thought the wolf, yep, there's wolves around or people with wolfish characteristics. Do you know what they want to do? They want to form their own little team around them. They, want, they must have their own sheep because the control spirit must have something to control. They go up into high places and look down at the situation. A wolf will get up the craggy rock, as it were, and he's looking down. Love leadership. Give me a position. Give me a title. What about a badge so that everybody knows I'm the leader? I haven't got a real problem with badges unless it's really done with the wrong spirit. Sometimes it's helpful to know who to go to. So if that ever happened to you, don't think we'll all become wolves. Just think that... <laughs> <laughs> unless you come near... <laughs> then you'll know. Then you'll know you've hit the, one, the wrong one. Uh, the, the high place, looking down. The thing that really gets the wolf going is blood. That's when he bears his teeth. If he can find strife, he'll get right into the midst of it and tear it open more and more and more until there's blood. This is a wonderful, gory message this morning. <laughs> I tell you, I got such a Holy Ghost awakening when I read these facts because I began to see how it's worked over the years. Some absolutely wolves, no doubt about it. Wrong intentions, wrong agendas. Others, wounded Christians who operate from their place of pain. 
and begin to bring further division and strife. But the true shepherd's anointing is the healing and the deliverance and the restoration and that needs to be part of our DNA. Spirit of the Lord's upon me, heal the sick, deliver the captives. Jesus said that. Restore those who are broken and those who have been used and abused. So we need to find the high places, bring them down. Low places, bring them up. And then we find in verse 4, third part, the crooked places will be made straight. Crooked places. What are crooked places? Crooked places are those things which are not honest and not truthful. It's a sense of, you know, this is not really the issue. This is not really the problem. It's a sense of something ducking and weaving. And some people say it's just their personality. No, it's more than a personality. You can have any kind of personality and walk in truth. There's something about a spirit that ducks and weaves and won't confront the real issue in their heart or in anyone else's heart. And then I realise the animal that ducks and weaves and moves like this is a serpent. The serpent cannot walk straight as he tried. Well, he's got no legs, he can't walk at all. But he can't, he can't, he can't, he hasn't even got the intelligence to slide straight. He has to duck and weave and duck and weave and duck and weave. Play the blame game. Pass it off onto someone else. It's not my responsibility. Duck and weave. The Lord says, get the crooked things and make them straight. Let your yes be yes, let your no be no. It's not that hard. And when you're not sure, just be silent. None of this ducking and weaving because it's the wrong spirit. And then it says that the rough places be made smooth. Rough places. What are the rough places? My own thinking is this. It's the abrasive bits of our own lives, the abrasive bits of our personality, where iron sharpens iron, where I find the things that are not fully resolved in my nature rub against the things that aren't in, in his nature, and we both are, oh, you know what, I don't like that part of you, I don't like that aspect of you. But what, what God's doing, putting us together, is iron sharpening iron. True Christian fellowship understands that we all have things we're dealing with, but the love begins to wear it down. Wear it down. Wear it down. Smooth it out. Sort it out. The more interaction, the less those jagged things are going to hurt. They're going to be smoothed off. Rough places. If I said today, who's got rough places? Well, I'll, I'll be the first. I've got some rough ends. There are things that are not totally Christ-like, just rough. Wounded things where you protect yourself, it's bits of you know, sharp areas where I can, I can get back at you and I can have a bit of revenge and a bit of gossip. I can do all that. You and I actually could be the biggest sinners in the world if we want to. Genesis said sin lies at the door. you just got to go to the wrong door and open it. It's all back again. It's only a memory away, a thought away and a decision away. Praise God, we've moved on, closed the doors, said, as for me, we're going straight. We're going that way in Jesus. So the result of this whole teaching in Isaiah 40, now to verse 5, when this is done, we've made it straight, we've sorted out that which is not right, we've, we've had healing and deliverance, the valleys are being exalted, brought down the pride, the ambition, the arrogance, the things that shook themselves up above others, bring it down, bring it down. Mountains are brought low. Crooked places are straightening out. Rough places are getting smooth. Look at the consequence of verse 5. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And who will see it? All flesh. All flesh. Do you not think your family, your friends will see it when Christ is formed in us? Do you think they not see it? One of the most wonderful things is when you hear someone saying, she's changed. Or when your testimony says, I've changed. What a, what a, no, there's no argument like it, no argument against it. I was blind once, but now I see. I'm different now. Why? Because the Holy Spirit through the Word has been working on me. And that force of righteousness is not hindered now by brokenness of wrong attitudes, wrong perceptions, wrong half-truths. The glory is revealed, all flesh shall see it and who declares it? The mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And I believe that this is still the hour that we're in. There's always a sense of further preparation. Until we see Jesus that will happen. But I believe we need to absolutely resolve major things. Get rid of the kingpins. ASAP. There's help available. This year we're starting a transformation centre. 
this is very spontaneous, so I don't know if I'm out of order, Val, am I? Tell me if I'm out of order, Dal, but Val, who's about to wave, is uh, going to be helping us set up uh, with a team, a transformation centre, which will be like, a, as it were, a triage centre for those who come in asking for a bit of help. You've got trained people to say, with the mind of the Lord, these are the things we can help you with. There's the word and study and there's prayer and there's deliverance and there's you know, a course that could help you with this and with that rather than the hit and miss approach where one size fits all and everybody's told to do the same thing. When people come in, God says, I'm listening to their cry and I'm making a way for them. And if we're discerning, we'll find, you know, what they need is maybe more time in the word. What they need is a small group where they can feel that they belong. What they need is some healing ministry. What they need is the deliverance of demonic power. What they need is, what do you think will be fantastic? It won't be done in the church setting, it will be done in the cafe, so people in the world will come in to a transformation centre. I hadn't planned to say it, Glenn, but it's all just popped out and there it is. And we've approached Val prayerfully, Glenn particularly has been behind this, but we've approached Val if she would prayerfully consider helping us set that up. And I believe your answer is? Hallelujah. Just stand and wave because they're going to see a lot more of you. This is Val Morton. Says, Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. But the end result is that the glory of the Lord should be revealed and all flesh will see it together. Now, this in no way minimises what God's doing in the Spirit with his outpouring. These are just principles of the Scriptures that will never change. Because you can have a mighty outpouring, but you need to have a release from the depth of within your own life. And those things that would hinder need to be removed. That's all it is. We're not looking inward to see all of our problems or looking upward to the glory, but these principles will help us. Let the word raise up the low places, bring down the high places, straighten things out, get the rough things sorted off and let the glory be revealed. Christ in us to hope the glory. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. God is good. Thank you, Jesus, this morning. Thank you, Lord. It's only February, Lord. It's early in the peace. This army is rising up, Lord God. Yeah. Father, we're taking hold of what you're saying. You said we're going to break out on the left and the right. You said revival of, is, going to, is going to break forth. You said that heroes are going to come out of that well of revival. And Father, we're saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. We speak it over the entire citywide church, but we will have our portion in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. We speak it over Darren and Rada at the hub. We say, Lord, the hub will continue to burst open to the left and right. Lord, mighty things, mighty things, mighty things. Is there anyone else here from other churches, other ministries? You represent other ministries that we could just, just, just stand if that's the case. We pray for you. This, Father, we pray for those representing other fellowships, churches and ministries. We declare, Father God, just reach out if they're near you. Just touch them, Father. We declare, Lord, they carry the glory. That they are carriers of the glory, carriers of the glory, carriers of the glory. We thank you, Jesus, in the mighty name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Is, is Tim still pastoring the work that you guys do? I feel the Lord, if you can give this word to him, just if you don't mind, I feel the Lord saying there's a mighty force of the Spirit coming behind him. The moment he's sort of there and stepping out in faith and he hasn't felt a lot, but he's about to feel the mighty rushing wind of the Spirit because as she goes into the highways and byways, into the parks and into the public places with ministry, the power of the Spirit will be behind me. I get a sense you're a little bit, not discouraged, but just questioning what to do. The Lord says the power of the Spirit's coming. You can tell him that. And darling, lift your hands up. Australian for Jesus. Do you reckon? Australian for Jesus. And Bunbury. And Bustleton. Get them all while you're there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Just pray in the Spirit, just for a couple of minutes. Oh, in the name of Jesus. How many people this morning would pay, say, you know, I just need that agreement prayer for fire? Maybe, you know, Christmas has been slow and low and hard and whatever, I don't know, but get a sense where people say, I just need that bit more fire to come. If you just come team will pray for you this morning. There's fire in the room this morning. You know, some may be making a new commitment for Christ, a new step of faith. Just come. 
love to help you this morning. Stay for fellowship, stay for a kappa. Mm.